Welcome back to Gendered. Today's topic is going to be about domestic violence. Now, before I begin, this episode does contain scenes that that some viewers may find disturbing or may not be suitable for younger audiences. Um, this could include a depiction of rape and sexual assault, which it will. So viewers' discretion is advised. So domestic violence is any behavior with with the purpose of gaining power and control over a spouse, partner, girlfriend, boyfriend, or intimate family members. Abuse is a learn. It's important to understand that abuse is a learned behavior. It is not caused by anger, mental problems, drugs, or alcohol, or other common excuses. When the general public talk thinks about domestic violence, however, they usually think in the terms of physical assault that results in a visible injury to the victim. However, this is only one type of abuse. There is also verbal, emotional, sexual, economical, and spiritual abuse. So many people don't know this, but I was in a domestic violence relationship. And the person I was in a domestic violence relationship with was the person who actually raped me. So this is the first time I'm talking about this, the full story of what really happened to me. I was around 18, turning 19 at the time, when I met S. S, again, if you aren't familiar, S is the pers- is what I called a person in the last video. So... S was around 24 years old at the time, and looking back at it now, knowing what I know now, I would have never dated somebody that much older than me. However, I constantly blame myself for dating somebody that old, instead of really turning this question around and asking myself, why is a 24-year-old man dating a teenage girl? Even though, regardless, I was 18, I was a teenager, and being 24 today, I would have never dated, I I will never date somebody who's a teenager who's like 18 and 19 years old, because looking at what I know now, an 18, 19 year old wouldn't know that. They don't understand certain things at that age, because you're just getting, you're just becoming an adult, you're just graduated from high school, you don't know what what to what the real world is really like. You are now leaving this inner circle or bubble to be in like a in in a bigger world, and so for that reason, I don't recommend any eighteen year old to be with somebody who's twenty four, twenty five. But I didn't know that back then, and so we were together for almost two years, and I left him when I was twenty years old. I was the one who, he came back and I was the one who said, I don't want to be with you anymore. So we met, so how all of this started when we met on Instagram and he reached out to me. I didn't pay much attention to him because I was with somebody else at the time, but he was very persistent. So I kept talking to him, but kept my distance. However, the person who I was with at the time was cheating on me and so I I mean he was constantly talking to me so I told him talked to him about it and this is what he ended up using to emotionally manipulate me into being with him so one day I had time between work and school so I was in in San Francisco and I was in school and I also had work but like I had like four hours in between so I texted him and said, let's meet up for lunch. He, ha- he has been asking me for weeks for lunch or to meet up with him. So I decided to give him a chance. Um, he was the nicest man I've ever met. So I kept talking to him and we went on dates. At this point, I was single and I, was, I started to like him. And I actually really started to like him. I really fell for him. He would like he would offer to bring me food to work since I was working until nine p.m. during that time. Uh, I thought I thought he was perfect. Then he started to change. 
He didn't like me hanging out with any of my friends on my day, days off, so he would plan last minute plans, then cancel them when it was too late for me to go out with my friends. He would constantly tell me that they were a bad influence, and but he would target them one by one without even knowing, without even meeting them or knowing who they were. I listened to him because for so long I thought that this was this relationship was more important was the most important relationship in my life. He then started to attack my family's character. See, he's Muslim and I am a Hindu. And our religions do not get along. And while people in our reli- with, between our religions get along, the religions itself, they don't get along at all. And he was born in a household that hated Hindus. He was born to hate Hindus. He even told me that his family never wanted anything to do with a Hindu in their entire lives. And so... Because our religions didn't get along, he would constantly talk about how my parents wouldn't accept him, him, and so I started hating my parents, which my parents never knew anything about this relationship. So I ended up jumping to conclusions because he took me, he brought me to the conclusions without, without thinking rationally. And he would also put doubts in my head about being a feminist and really having my own voice. Like, for example, when I would talk to him about feminism and what it means to me, he would, his response was very negative in the way of, oh, is that what you think feminism is? Or he would just say, He he would in in ways he would constantly doubt, make me doubt that I was a feminist. He would make me doubt myself and not believe in myself, for being a feminist. And because of that, I was very insecure and I had so much self. I had no self confidence when it came to speaking out about these things after after that relationship. I thought I was stupid and I didn't know what I was talking about. It didn't. Um, so after a few months, I had no friends. I was constantly fighting with my parents, and I had no one except him. I also lost the ability to think for myself, and I really felt very insecure about my intelligence and my intellectuals and what I was worth as a person. So he then. He then started to call me names like fucking idiot and I started to believe him. The first time, so I really did start to believe him. Like I really thought I was stupid and anytime I would make a mistake or I would do something he didn't like or if he got mad, he would call me a fucking idiot. Anytime I I would say something that he thought was stupid to him i was a fucking idiot so but and then this re- this this constant belittling of my character it was the first step because the next thing that happened ended up being physical abuse so the first time he hit me was a wednesday around 6 p.m. when i drove to sf to meet him which is something I always had to do because he never came to the East Bay to see me. Now, this was on the Embarcadero in front of the Wells Fargo Bank in San Fran- in downtown San Francisco. And this was also rush hour. And honestly, I've never driven in San Francisco before. I've always ever taken part. And I was a, a brand new driver at that time too. So I did my best to drive into San Francisco. I was terrified. This was rush hour. There was a lot of people. There was a lot of cars. I was a brand new driver. And for a lot of people who don't know, if you're driving in downtown San Francisco, it can get very crazy driving around here, especially when you have just recently got your license and you've never driven in the, in the big city before. 
So I drove to SF to see him. And and because driving in SF was so hard for me, he ended up having to take to drive my car the rest of the time. And so while he was driving in front of the Wells Fargo bank account bank on the Embarcadero, he said something. I can't remember exactly what he said. I joking jokingly said shut up. And what he did next was he gra- he then grabbed me by the throat, strangled me, held onto me really tight and said, "Are you going to say shut up to me again?" He repeated that a few times until I ended up saying, "No, I'm not going to." Then he forced his uh, he forced my mouth open, forced his tongue down my throat and pushed me pushed me almost like throwing me hard enough that I hit the window. Luckily, I wasn't hurt by the window, but I didn't say anything the entire time we were together that night. Things like that can like this continued to happen and it happened for uh, for about for almost 2 years the entire time we were together. I really had no one to talk to or turn to. The only friend I I really talked to at the time thought everything was normal when I told her. And if I didn't listen to S, he would and every time I didn't listen to S, he would constantly get mad. I felt like I was suffocating but I couldn't get out of it because I didn't have anybody at that time. I didn't I thought that I was going to be alone and I was so scared of being alone that I that I ended up staying in this abusive relationship. I really felt like I had nobody left on on this planet besides this man because I was isolated from him. from the entire world except for him. So it wasn't until I finally said I don't want anything to do with uh, do with him and to leave me alone. I quit so after the incident that happened, the sexual assault that happened. I quit my job in SF and I quit school and he didn't know where I lived because he never came to my house to visit me. So when I blocked him, I I told him I never wanted anything to do with him ever again. And when I blocked him, I just left SF and didn't go back for 2 years. I started college again in San Mateo, so he couldn't find me, but I was still terrified every day. I saw his face everywhere I went. It was like I was trapped in a nightmare and couldn't get out. I couldn't eat, sleep or breathe. My great suffered and i barely made made it to a 2.95 gpa i used drugs every day and i drank to till i was numb till i uh, till i was able to numb the pain i just wanted the suffering to end but even leaving him didn't stop anything he still followed me in my head after after i began getting therapy i decided to confront him and i did over the video chat I even did my me too story on Instagram. I told him that he doesn't scare me and that if he ever came near me again, everyone who knows me will know who to blame if something happened to me. It took 2 years for me to get over what he did to me, but it still hurts me to this day. And I was diagnosed with post traumatic stress disorder. and that is something that i'm going to have to deal with every day for the rest of my life because even though i now have treatment for my ptsd for me ptsd was that i was living these these events in my head and i couldn't stop i was imprisoned in my own head by constantly replaying the events that occurred and that happened to me And so for that reason I'm I have to accept that I'm going to have these traumatic episodes and have to deal with these traumatic events for the rest of my life and it's something that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. So what are what is everything that I just told you? Everything that I just told you has to do with domestic violence. 
And breaking this down, you have physical abuse, which is physically aggressive behavior, withholding of physical needs, and indirect physical harmful behaviors or threats of physical abuse against a partner. Now, aggressive behavior is hitting, kicking, biting, slapping, shaking, pushing, pulling, punching, choking, beating, scratching, pinching, pulling hair, stabbing, shooting, drowning, burning, hitting with an object, threatening with a weapon, or threatening to physically assault. That's aggressive behavior. Withholding of physical needs would go under interruption of sleep or meals, denying, denying money, food transportation, food transportation or help if sick or injured, locking the victim into, into or out of the house, refusing to give or rationing necessities. Um, an abuser can also threaten the threaten to injure children, pets, or special properties, um, forcibly f- uh, physically restrain against the victim's will being trapped in a room or having the ex- exit blocked being held down, uh, the batterer hitting or kicking walls, doors, or other inanimate objects during an argument, and holding the victim hostage. So that's physical abuse. However, during the earlier stages of domestic violence, you often see emotional abuse. And emotional abuse is any behavior that exploits another's vulnerability, insecurity, or character, such as such as continuous degrade degra- degrading and intimidation, manipulation, brainwashing, control of another to detriment of that individual. So it's characterized as insulting or criticizing to undermine the victim's self-confidence, uh, public humiliation, threatening or accusing either directly or indirectly with intentions to cause emotional or physical harm or loss, um, forcing the victim to take drugs, telling the victim that she is mentally unstable or incompetent, um, using actions and statements or gestures to attack the victim's self-esteem and self-worth with intentions to humiliate. These all fall under emotional abuse because they're emotionally abusing the vic- the victim. The abuser is emotionally abusing the victim to to have a sense of control over them. So the next one after that would be verbal abuse. And this would be coercion, threats, and blame. And it uses abusive language, which is used to embarrass or threaten the victim. Threatening to... So this will come in the forms of threatening to hurt or kill the victim or the child for or children or families, pets, property, reputation, etc. Um, calling names uh, such as ugly, bitch, whore, stupid. In my uh, experience, it was fucking idiot. Uh, telling victims that they are unattractive or undesirable. Now, S did this a lot to me. He would constantly say that every time I had glasses on, I was ugly. But when I didn't have glasses on, I was beautiful. And so I was just very insecure about my glasses. And I really thought that without them, I w- with them, I was very ugly. And that that's why nobody wanted to be around me except for him, which was not true. <laughs> to this day, it's not true. So after verbal abuse, we have sexual abuse which is rape, which is using force, coercion, guilt, or manipulation, or not considering the victim's desire to have sex. Now, sexual abuse can also be exploiting a victim who is unable to make an informed decision about the involvement of sexual activity, and it can also be in the form of prostitution or forcing the victim to have sex with another person, for or not for money. 
And then after that, you have spiritual abuse, which is any, which is for any person of any belief system is capable of perpetrating spiritual abuse just as anyone can be the victim of it. Signs of spiritual abuse between intimate partners are ridicules or insults the other person's religious or spiritual beliefs, prevents the other partner from practicing their religion or spiritual beliefs, and uses their partner's religious or spiritual beliefs to manipulate or shame them. S would constantly shame me for being a Hindu. He, there was never a day he didn't bring up the fact that I was a Hindu and to shame me for it. Now, this person can also use religion as a form to minimize or rationalize abuse in the forms of physical, financial, emotional, or sexual abuse slash marital rape and marital rape. Uh, and so lastly, we have economical abuse, which is controlling the family income and either not allowing the victim access to the money or rigidly limiting their access to family funds. And this may also result in keeping financial secrets or hidden accounts, putting the victim on an allowance or allowing the victim no say in how money is spent or making the victim turn their paycheck over to the abuser. Um, this can also cause victims to lose jobs or preventing them from taking a job is when the abuser can make the victim lose their job by making them late to work, refusing to provide transportation to work, or by just calling, harassing, or even calling the victim at work. So what is the result of this t- these types of abuse? Well, all these abuses result in isolation and control of the victim. So isolation is actually another type of abuse is often closely connected to controlling of behaviors. It is not an isolation of behavior. It's not an isolated behavior, but it's an outcome of many kinds of abusive behaviors. By keeping the victim from seeing who they want to see, doing what they want to do, setting goals and meeting setting and meeting goals and controlling how the victim thinks and feels the abuser is isolating the victim from the resources both personal and public which may help the victim leave the relationship by keeping the victim socially isolated the better is keeping the victim from contact with the world which might not reinforce the abuser's per- perceptions and so with all of this in mind, you we have the media. We see domestic violence in pop culture all the time. And an example of domestic violence being romanticized is actually in something that we all know and love, which is Disney. Disney has constantly used Disney princesses princesses to romanticize domestic violence, to romanticize being a victim, to romanticize this savior complex that if you are having a hard time or if something is going wrong, that a man can come and save you. A man will do will help you in these terrible situations that you're in. And we see this in the story of Cinderella, where she meets a prince once dances with him, falls in love, and leaves. However, she still has, she comes from an abusive household where she's not loved by her stepmother and stepsisters. And she's, she's treated as a, as a servant in her own house. So, 1 in 15 children are exposed to intimate partner violence each year, and about 90% of these children are eyewitnesses to this violence. And within those 90%, more than half of those children are cont- will continue this cycle of violence throughout their lifetimes with, within their relationships. And that's what we see in Cinderella, where she's in an abusive situation. Granted, it's not intimate partner violence. However, she's in this abusive situation. 
And for her, finding a prince, getting married, and leaving is the savior complex. However, in real life, if this happens, more than likely, if you do not know this person, you don't trust this person, and you end up leaving with this person and getting married to this person, it is very much likely that it's going to end up in a domestic violence relationship because theoretically, that's all you typically know when you come from a house of abuse. Now, moving forward to another Disney princess who was Jasmine from Aladdin. Jasmine is very vocal about not wanting to be seen as just a prize or possession for her future husband. And we actually see this a lot in Disney movies where the the princess is very vocal and and wants to be heard, but at the same time she's silenced by a man who she falls in love with. So in Aladdin in particular, Aladdin is basically like the original catfish. He's catf- he, he's pretending to be somebody he's not to get her because he's not a prince and she has to marry a prince. Now, at the end of the movie, when Aladdin is exposed, he's not, um, she accepts him. He doesn't get in trouble for anything. They don't break up. They're just, they live happily ever after. Disney's old-fashioned happily ever after. And it's basically saying that it's okay to lie and manipulate your partner into being with you because at the end of it, because you're a nice person and at the end of it, it's you're finally going to tell them the truth. And it's not okay to lie and manipulate your partner. It's never okay to start off a relationship by lying and manipulating your partner. <laughs> and the, so this brings me to my the last movie, which was Beauty and the Beast. Now, Beauty and the Beast, it's basically the entire movie lays out different aspects of domestic violence. You know, Belle is locked up in a tower. Belle is is not allowed to see her father, her any of her friends, anybody she knows. Well, she didn't have any friends, but like her, she's not allowed to see her loved ones, and she has she's forced to stay here in this castle with this beast. And when we continue, when we progress in the movie, you see like the beast being so brutally mean to her so abusive physically abusive emotionally and verbally abusive very explicit when it comes to abuse when it comes to beauty and the beast and when continuously go when progressing in the movie you then see that well now beast has changed and bell is starting to like him well she's starting to fall in love with him and it just sends out this message that no matter how horrible a person can be to you, if you are nice enough to them, if you give them that patience and that love and that care, you can change this person. And it's nobody's job to change a person who isn't a good person to begin with. If somebody wants to change themselves, they have to change themselves without the help of somebody else. Yes, you can support somebody who wants to change, but you should not be the reason why somebody changes and you should not have that role or that job to change somebody. And while I was in this relationship, I realized that, yes, I really thought that I can change him. I thought that, well, this was just a rocky start right now. He'll get better and he'll be nicer and I can I can show him that I'm not... I'm not going to hurt him and that I can be there for him and that I'll change him. I really thought that if I just stuck it out long enough that he will change. But the reality is that he was never going to change to begin with because that's who he was. He was somebody that would abuse and attack because that's what he learned and that's... That's what he grew up with, and that is the nature that he grew up with. And so, when looking at 
you know, domestic violence within this country, on average, nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. Um, and that results within 10 million women and men uh, per year within the United States. One in four women will experience severe in intimate partner physical violence every year, which results in injury, fearfulness, post-traumatic stress disorder, as it was in my case, the use of victim services, contraction of, and contraction of sexually transmitted diseases. And in one in three women will have experienced some form of physical violence by an intimate partner. Intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crimes. The presence of a gun in a domestic violence situation increases the risk of homicide by 500%. And 19% of domestic violence involves a weapon. So when... Talking about this, we come to the U.S. Supreme Court case of United States versus Hayes. Now, under West Virginia law, it is unlawful for any person who has been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. Misdemeanor crime of domestic violence. So under West Virginia law, domestic violence is just a misdemeanor. Um, so this was a law to prevent possession of firearms if you had a misdemeanor domestic violence crime. Now, Randy Hayes, who, pl pled who pled guilty for a misdemeanor battery offense, was then found 10 years later um, in a domestic violence call, um, call response from the police at his home. So while conducting a search of the premises, the police uncovered a Winchester rifle. They arrested Hayes for possessing a firearm, even though he was convicted of a misdemeanor in 1994. And Hayes argued that prior to the conviction for the misdemeanor battery did not constitute a conviction for a misdemeanor crime of violence under the statute. And so the district court, the United States District Court, of Northern District of West Virginia rejected his argument and Hayes entered a conditional guilty plea to reserve his claim for appeal. He then appealed to the United States Courts of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit who reversed the district court. And the court held that the conviction of the misdemeanor battery does not qualify as a crime of domestic violence noting that the legislative intent and plain meaning of the statute indicated that the original offense must involve a domestic relationship between the victim and the offender. And when this case went on to the United States Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said yes. Hayes' rights were violated under the United States Constitution, and the Supreme Court reversed the Fourth Circuit holding that the predicate offense statute need not include the existence of a domestic relationship as an element of the crime in order to qualify as a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence is specified as specified by the gun control act of 1968 the court reasoned that the language of the gun control act suggested that the predicate offense statute need only include the use of force as an element of the crime and not and need not include a domestic relationship as an el additional element when there is rights for violence against women we do have the violence against women act which is wava which is makes it a federal crime to cross state lines to physically injure an intimate partner um, to cross state lines to stalk or harass or stalk or harass within the maritime or territorial lands of the United States and to cross state lines to enter or leave and violate a qualifying protection order. And there are rights for victims. 
you know, such as the right of fairness and to be treated with fairness and respect for the victim's dignity and privacy, the right to be notified of court proceedings, the right to sit in court, and to the right to restitution, the right to confer with the attorney of the government. However, there's also the right to reasonable protection from the accused offender. Now, this is a very important right to look at, reasonable protection from the accused offender. Now, in the case of Castle, Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, Jessica Gonzalez requested a restraining order against her estranged husband. A state trial court issued the order with, which prohibited the husband from seeing Gonzalez or their three daughters except during prearranged visits. A month later, Gonzalez's husband abducted the three children, and Gonzalez repeatedly urged the police to search for and arrest her husband, but the police told her to wait until the evening to see if her husband brought the children back home. And uh, during the night, her, her husband murdered all three children and then opened fire inside the police station where the police returned, fired, and killed him. And so Gonzalez brought this complaint to the federal district courts alleging that the Castle Rock police had violated her rights of due process of the Constitution by will willfully and ne negligently refusing to enforce her restraining order. So the Due Process Clause states that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. The courts dismissed the claim, ruling that no pr principal, substantive, nor procedural due process allows Gonzalez to sue a local government for its failure to enforce a restraining order. Now, the United States Supreme Court in a 7-2 decision said that the court ruled that Gonzalez's had no constitutional protect had no constitutional protection of property interest in the enforcement of the restraining order and therefore could not claim that the police had violated her rights to due process and in order to have property interest in a benefit as abstract as enforcement of a restraining order, the court ruled that Gonzalez w would have needed a legitimate claim of entitlement to the benefit. And so while a part of vi victims' rights is the right to be reasonably protected from the accused offender, is a right in this country, in this case, um, Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, she didn't have that protection. She didn't have reasonable protection by law enforcement because her children were killed, were murdered in cold blood, and the police didn't do anything to stop it. They didn't search, they just waited. And this is going to continue to be a problem in this country as long as we, as a culture, accept the principles and privilege of male dominance. We saw this in the first in the first episode where there's male dominance within the private sector, and that is why women cannot progress. Well, it's not just in the private sector. It's not just in job opportunities. It's not just in government. It's within the home. There is male dominance within the home, and men will continue to be abusive. And as long as we as a culture accept and tolerate violence against women, Men will continue to be abusive, and we will continue as second-class citizenship, wishing to be equals. And that is what it means to be gendered in the United States. Welcome back to Gendered. Today's topic is going to be about domestic violence. Now, before I begin, this episode does contain scenes that 